So hello, everyone. Um, my name is Patrick Wu. Uh, I'm going to be talking about single page uh, applications at scale. Um, so I'm going to turn up that flux capacitor. And uh, uh, yeah, with 1.21 gigawatts, we should get started. But a little bit about me. Um, I'm a, a software development manager at AWS. Uh, we're building something super secret, confidential stuff for a project called Beehive. Um, and I love basketball, and I love movies from the 80s. Um, and also, we are a sponsor, so super excited to be uh, really helping to contribute to this community. I'm super excited about all the speakers here, and yeah. Um, but what do I mean by SPA at scale? Like, what do I mean by single page applications at scale? Well, uh, our project is about 200,000 lines of code, and this is um, not a glified compressed uh, version, but this is like pre-transpiled versions of, uh, of our actual application with uh, over 50 front-end engineers working on the project across uh, Seattle, San Francisco, Cupertino, and Vancouver. So we have a very distributed team. Um, we're all very, very, very excited about our launch, um, but we had a few bumps along the way. Uh, so let's go back in time, and I want to talk to you about our top five lessons learned so far. Um, lesson one was first getting to know our customers. Uh, so a lot of the times, as engineers, uh, we're, we're working, and we're like, oh, this works. And uh, it works, it works on, on, on my machine. It works on Chrome. I'm good, right? But actually, our customers are also on Edge, Firefox, Safari, and I just found out maybe some of them are on Beaker today. So cross-browser compatibility is an actual thing. Um, and, and you might say, well, Patrick, these are evergreen browsers. They're all compliant, right? They all should work, right? Uh, well, actually, on, we faced this problem recently. We're trying to get our performance metrics working. And on Firefox version 60 to 62, um, we observer that observer was throwing an error. Right? And uh, we had to solve that. So we had to actually uh, fix that and address that for that issue. But they addressed it in version 63. But 60 is actually long-term support. And you're saying, well, that's not, they solved it in version 63, right? So that, that, should, that should do the job. But actually, um, on some corporate environments, not everyone has the latest version of that particular browser. So we have to really think about those users as well as we're building something at scale. Um, the other thing is operating system issues. So Mac, PC, we use libraries and frameworks like React, Vue, Ember, I forgot to include that, dang it, Angular, uh, Babel plugins to help address cross-browser uh, browser compatibility issues, but uh, don't think that things will just work. Um, and you know, this is the thing that we really learned. Um, a prime example was, we didn't know scroll bars display on PCs. We're all on Macs. And uh, uh, so we had to manually enable having it display uh, by default on Mac, uh, which was, you know, you're saying, well, that's not a big issue, right? But actually, if we use a virtualized scroll, this kind of happens. That one pixel deviation um, was actually causing performance issues where uh, the virtualized list was just kept on moving up and down. And uh, uh, all, of, all of the people on, um, on the business side who had PCs were complaining about our app not functioning. Um, so yeah, we had to really consider that um, operating systems. Um, the other thing was testing for great experiences also includes slow connections, right? So what's awesome with the Chrome DevTools, I know if many of you are familiar with this, but this was really revealing for us was people are on uh, slower connections that are not Wi-Fi and high speed. Uh, so we ha really had to test to see if our uh, actual application functions on slower connections, on a 3G connection, et cetera. Um, the other thing was to even think about the actual machines. So we have, as engineers, high-powered MacBook Pros. Um, and that's awesome. But some people are also on slower machines. So uh, really thinking about throttling our CPU to really kind of simulate those environments. Um, so there's also some great tools that we really learned about to test connectivity. Um, and some of those tools are an open source project called Web Page Test that we uh, run internally um, to really test out our application. So to simulate like a cable connection or a 3G connection, et cetera. Um, 
And then the, another really cool tool that we really learned uh, was uh, Lighthouse. Uh, so that was also allowing us to kind of uh, see simulated experience as well. Um, and it has a really great uh, accessibility score, uh, which is really awesome as well. Um, the le second lesson that we learned was about documentation, documenting our code. So one of the reasons we learned that was as we got new engineers, again, 50 engineers, and we we're, we're, we're keep growing, and um, we had to keep shoulder tapping people, like, what does this component do? Um, and documentation is absolutely pivotal uh, to the project, but it's really hard. Uh, it's hard to maintain, it's hard to understand, and it's difficult to scale. Like, you would change a particular function and you wouldn't go back to your source, the documentation to actually update it. Um, and that happened way too frequently. So we thought, how can we solve this problem? Uh, one of the things we, we introduced was, and I know some people might, might not like this, but we actually you know, ended up using TypeScript. And uh, talk, TypeScript was actually um, helped us with docu like having documentation in code, because it allows for self-documenting code by providing um, great IDE support, like the autocomplete on, uh, on that, where for our props were pretty amazing. Type checking, uh, misspelling a component name would help us uh, surface those things a lot quicker. Uh, required props provide a nice error message, um, and then uh, helps us easily refactor by renaming our components. So it's not like a search and replace, but it will actually help us rename our components for the ones that we're actually working on. Um, the other thing was that TypeScript interfaces allows us to be explicit about our component props and uh, surface details about our components for all consumers. So one of the things that we do is we have distributed teams, and when we talk about the components uh, that we're going to build, we talk about it through our interfaces that we first built. So that was kind of a really helpful thing for us to kind of document. So this all goes back to um, you know that, that awesome book that we all might have read, which is Clean Code, but the actual author of the code uh, of this quote is um, Gary Bush, uh, not Uncle Bob. Uh, and it's, clean code is simple and direct, and clean code should read like well-written prose. So, and that's where we're hoping to move more towards uh, by adopting TypeScript. But that's great for our engineering teams, but it doesn't really work for some of our business stakeholders and our designers that we work with and interact with. So how can we all be on the same page as well? So the thing that we adopted was uh, Storybook. Storybook for our React components is it, it rocks, and it's super awesome. It allows us to host documentation about our components. Uh, it provides a single source of truth for designers, product owners, and our engineers. Um, so one of the problems why this was really pivotal for us was we would get a spec, and uh, it's continuously iterating, and I would, I would talk to the designer and said, hey, uh, Bob, like, what's, the, what's, the, what's the file? Is this the, the actual file? And they're like, yeah, that, that's the actual final file. I'm like, are you sure this is the actual final file? All right, let me reach out out to uh, Sandra, and Sandra's like, no, this is the ultimate final file for sure. And there's no, I, I don't know why they don't have code versioning, maybe they do, but they don't have a Git for designers, so it was really hard to find the source of truth. So that was really challenging, at least for us. So what we ended up doing is, Storybook was allow, allowed for a great workflow with our design systems and our single source of truth. Um, so what we, we have is, we, ha we incorporated Airbnb's React Sketch app, uh, and we could generate sketch symbols from our actual React component components to share with the design teams. So an uh, engineer would build a React component, generate a sketch symbol, hand that off to the design team, and they continuously iterate upon that, hand that off to us, and then we continuously increment upon that and actually deploy that to production. And again, that's kind of a single source of truth so that everyone's on the same page. And the beautiful part, it's version controlled by Git. So that's awesome as well. Um, lesson three is Tests. Uh, I know this is, might be obvious, but it's actually um, one of the most like uh, foundational pieces um, for us. Like testing might seem obvious, uh, easy, but I emphasize this as a lesson learned because it helped us uh, gain confidence in our code. Um, a lot of times we would deploy to prod and. Uh, we didn't really have too much confidence because we, we, we thought it worked on a machine, again, like the cross-browser compatibility issues, but we had uh, we reduced a lot, introduced a lot of regressions. Um, it also re reduced the time to first commit for our new hires. Um, so we would get new hires, and uh, they would, um, because the code was you know, fairly well tested, it was actually easier for them to onboard, and you know, within the first one to two days, they were actually able to commit. Um, and it, we have a foundational base as well. Uh, also, it reduces having to ping different engineers to try to find out what's going on. Um, and the testing framework that we ended up using was Jest. Um, Jest is actually really great for what we do. Uh, it enables us to uh, write unit tests um, with 
just with Enzyme. It also allows us to write integration tests, um, and it also allows us to have component snapshot tests to kind of get visibility into uh, whether our, that particular component has changed. Um, so this is from testingjavascript.com, which is an amazing resource, but it basically kind of goes over uh, the different pieces. So with static tests, uh, you know, to catch typos and errors, um, we would actually use TypeScript for that. Uh, unit, we're using Jest. Integration, we're using Jest again. And end-to-end, -end, we're playing and experimenting with possibly using Jest with Puppeteer, but again, Puppeteer only is supported on Chrome, so that's kind of one of the, the issues that we're kind of looking into. Um, so again, I just really want to highlight how awesome testingjavascript.com is, a great resource by Kenzie Dodds and other amazing contributors, so definitely worth checking out. But things can still break in production. So you have your awesome pipeline test, right? You got, hey, you know, um, from you know, this particular environment to this particular environment to prod, like it went through code coverage, I got 80%, I'm good. Uh, integration tests, they're all passing. Um, and my end-to-end -end tests are passing, so I should be good. And I don't have to worry about prod. And actually, as an engineering manager, this is my interview question, right? So pro tip here. Things can still break in production, and we need to still uh, think about our customers while they're in production. Um, so what do we do? We actually have monitors and alarms to provide visibility into our production health for our application to ensure that the deployments and the dependencies are there. So for example, your CDN might go down. Don't you want to get visibility into whether uh, that actually happens? Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we learn as well. Um, and the other thing is we just, we're very focused on our customers. We don't want to kind of have them be our manual QA team. So um, again, that's the reason why we're focused on monitoring. So now we, get, we use uh, specifically CloudWatch, in our case, AWS, right? So, uh, and it helps us collect, monitor, and act and analyze on our actual metrics. Um, because as Kyle Simpson uh, of Functional Light JavaScript mentions, um, code that you cannot trust uh, is code that you do not understand. And I would say also in the same like, theme, code that you do not test or you haven't tested is really code that you don't really understand as well. So um, that's one of the things that we learn. All right. Lesson four, uh, yagging. Now, I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with the term, but it, it's a popular term uh, coined uh, among the engineering communities, but it means you ain't going to need it. Um, and as engineers, we kind of have a tendency to fall into tunnel vision. Uh, uh, we tend to uh, get stuck in tunnel vision over optimizing. Like, I, you know, this has to really, I'm, I'm trying to reduce time to interact this. I'm, I'm trying to get that first meaningful paint time down. And I'm trying to uh, reduce, uh, look at the memory heap. Uh, the Patrick, this is ridiculous. We need to reduce this. This, this is, uh, and we, we just kind of rat hole into this particular perspective. Instead of like seeking feedback early and often in atomic pieces. So just like in your code reviews where you have an atomic commit and you, you send out a code review for that and uh, like a pull request, whatever, and it's an atomic bite-sized piece and you want to seek feedback early and often so that you're not creating a massive like 20 page code review, right? Or pull request um, so that it actually helps uh, provide context. And in the same sense, uh, in terms of our deployments, we want to really think about the, the features that we're building. Yes, I do believe performance is important, but first you got to capture metrics on that. Uh, two, um, you want to get it into like these tiny atomic pieces so you can get feedback early from your customers uh, to know how to move forward. Um, because your customers and the business are eager to help avoiding uh, wasting dev cycles. Uh, that's kind of the things that we learned. So all we need to do is really just stop and listen. Because who knows? Uh, you might have already built something really cool, right? Uh, one, one, one note about this slide is I always wondered, did, is this kid really happy that he broke the, <laughs> the scooter? But I mean, he looks kind of happy about getting a skateboard. But again, um, yeah, anyways. <laughs> all right. Um, the biggest lesson, uh, and you know, I, I think if you take away anything of those four lessons that, that we learned, um, um, that I really want to share with this group is that, um, is this one, and I, just take away this biggest lesson, and that is to be kind, rewind, right? So, um, you know, the, earlier in the day, there used to be a place where we'd go, right, um, to, to, <laughs> to a place, and you would, uh, you would just go through the aisles and pick out something like a nice movie, and then you, you go to the checkout line, grab a patch, uh, pack of uh, Sour Patch Kids, and uh, maybe a, a pop, and then you go home, and then you, 
you, you enter this uh, little block thing uh, into this other device and you hit play and boom, you're able to watch an amazing movie. Uh, and it was awesome. And at the end of it, there's this always on this, on this uh, the particular thing you would see, be kind, rewind. And um, you know, because you wanna be thoughtful about that next person who's gonna wanna enjoy this movie, you would actually be kind and rewind most of the time, unless you're super lazy. Um, and the reason I harp on this is because um, you know a lot of us as engineers, they you know at least in my case, I met amazing engineering managers, amazing technical leads, amazing uh, software engineers who were uh, showed empathy and was able to kind of work with me. Uh, they were like you know when they showed empathy when they were reviewing my code, they showed empathy when um, I was trying to learn something really complex like maybe even WebAssembly. Um, they were they were they showed empathy and compassion, and I think a lot of times maybe. As, as these things are evolving, we might lose out on that. So like one of the things I like to remind um, our engineering teams is to conti continue to show that empathy. We work with a diverse group of people that are 50 engineers, and I think um, you know, one of the things we like to do is just make sure that we're not too uh, emotional about the, our code review process. Yeah, you get a 20-page CR, and um, you might want to just be a little more empathetic about you know, that process of how you review that code, but also, um, when it comes to like pair programming and taking the time to actually help other engineers uh, getting to understand a particular function. Um, so yeah, that's the biggest lesson I hope everyone takes away from, uh, from at least what I'm presenting on. And uh, that's actually it, that's my presentation. So thank you everyone, we're out of time. Um, <laughs> also, it, right next, <laughs> Right next to us is uh, our AWS lounge. You can meet our um, um, awesome other engineering managers, and we're hiring. So hit us up. Thank you.